So Shakia, I, I think of, we got to do a little bit of research, Ken Shropshire and I, uh, some years back, Major League Baseball had their task force right when the, you know, Robinson movie came out, 42. And when we interviewed some of the current Black American players and asked them for who their role models were or heroes, most of the time they said Michael Jordan. There were King Griffey's were thrown in there a few times additionally, but I want to talk about the kind of culture of baseball and, and the popularity of, of athletes, right? When, when you look at baseball, how is baseball, you know, not meeting the call in terms of embracing culture that might really engage folks outside of the audience of 50 year old white men who show up <laughs> at the games, right? No, yeah. So that's a big deal to me. Um, in the 90s, I was I was a kid and I remember thinking the backwards cap was cool. The gold chain is cool. And and, you know, baseball has sort of bucked at what is cool. And I mean, we all know, I think it's pretty much accepted that like African-Americans are the purveyors of cool. And, you know, that's what's going to get a lot of people involved is you can't have a commercial with rap or hip hop, but then you don't want that in the ballpark. You can't, you know, use our slang to promote your game on social media, but you don't want that in your ballpark. Like you, it, it just can't, you can't have it both ways. And I think like the, the lack of embrace of what's popular amongst young people is stunting the growth, right? Like, I don't want to go to a game and listen to whatever is playing right now, to be quite honest with you. Like, it's just not, it's not fun. It's not fun. It, a, a sporting event is supposed to have a fun atmosphere and ballparks lack in that, you know? Sure. Well, um, you know, coming up in the inner city in LA, um, the opportunities were presented in the same manner as they are today, of course. You know, now it's so driven by youth, uh, youth club team baseball. And it basically has become a, a big money maker for a lot of different people. And those opportunities are just like any other sport as far as uh, golf and, and, and say hockey and those, those sports where you have to have other individuals participating um, for you to play in, you have to have the income to do it. You know, basketball has always been a thing where you could put a hoop up and go work on your game, and that's what we could do. We could always find kids to play football in the park, but baseball required equipment and a, and a place to play. And, and now it's been driven by the economic part of it, where single family members can't necessarily afford to have their children uh, participating in these sports at two or three hundred dollars just to be on the team. Then you have to travel, so it becomes a socioeconomic issue basically, instead of an issue of, 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 our, of our youth not wanting to play the game. Because now currently my brother coaches now in, uh, in, Thousand, in Thousand Oaks at Oaks Christian High School. And he sees the same thing where he has athletes now. He gets the athletes to come out and play. And you know, he tries to eliminate that price point where they can deal, you know, where they can play and now they get the exposure they need. But basically it's exposure and also the amount of uh, socioeconomics that we can deal with. Shakia was saying that I find interesting as well is that <clears throat> one of the biggest problems that baseball has had is that, you know, most sports today adapt to the people who play it, right? If you watch the NBA or if you follow the history of the NBA, I mean, it was just as white and you know, racist as all the other sports. And the same is true of the NFL. And then at some point you get to bird and magic and you get in and the ABA, obviously Dr. J comes in and changes the whole culture. And now the NBA recognizes that it's valuable to adapt to the people who play it. There was no point resisting it, calling the, you know, when they used to call the ABA a ghetto game, right? And they didn't want you to put the ball between your legs. Or when I was a kid growing up, um, you know, white coaches didn't want you to switch directions by putting the ball between your legs because that was too street. And now they teach you to do that. <laughs> they teach you to do the very thing that they told you was not acceptable to do because that sport has grown. And when you watch a basketball game, they play music during the game. Guys bring the ball up court. You can hear music. There's, it's actually playing while the game's going on. 
Um, you know, the NFL has always dealt with this as the no fun league. And the NFL is constantly battling between adapting to the, the black culture and whether or not they're going to throw a flag for taunting every time someone shows some emotion. But eventually, you know, they realize that they have to adapt to the people who play it. Baseball is a Southern minor league, tough ass redneck game. It always has been because that's where the minor leagues are. And that's how the sport. I mean, one of the things about integration that people never talk about is that because you didn't have black players for all those years, you created a white culture in the sport and you've been trying to adapt to something else. You've been trying to evolve ever since. And so when Shakia is talking about, you know, Griffey, people went nuts when he had his hat on backwards just to take batting practice. I mean, this was an affront. This was, this was a, a, a cultural moment where it was like, you are absolutely disgracing this sport. And you see the fact that one of the things that baseball has really not done a very good job of, and they're trying, and you can see how late they are now because everyone's making a big deal about hitting a home run and flipping a bat because they don't adapt to who plays the sport. You go watch a game in Korea, hit a home run, the bat goes flying and they go run the bases and people cheer. It's not a big deal, right? I mean, you watch, watch Caribbean baseball, go watch the Caribbean World Series, go watch Winter League Ball, the Latino baseball and the Central American baseball, they play with all kinds of joy and energy. You go back and look at Negro League Baseball. Negro League Baseball played with some flash, with some style, with they all those sports, all those different leagues adapted to the people who played it. And then when each one of them come to Major League Baseball, they have to become white. They have to learn how to play within whiteness because the game is too rigid. And now it's late in the sport. And now you're trying to catch up and you can see how awkward it looks when you're trying to catch up. Okay, let's, they, they look so thirsty. They're desperately trying to find something that's cool that somebody can stick, you know, something will stick because they're so far behind. And it all stems back to the real rigid traditional culture of the sport. And at some point you have to begin to let that go and embrace who's playing your game. And if you embrace who's playing your game, more people will play it. And it just hasn't really translated. It's very, very difficult for the game to allow that. Lonnie, how do we solve uh, this problem? One of the things that I think would have a huge impact is definitely at the community level. I think that um, what's really lacking, one of the, the images um, like at the Negro League Baseball Museum is you saw that the players it was a priority, it was beyond responsibility um, to go back into the community and have presence. And that was just a given. And that was one of the things that motivated, and we've talked about it as early, you know, we talked about Stu and Ricky earlier and the impact that they had on, you know, the community as a whole, but also future players. And I, I think that that is first and foremost, because just like the NBA, you know, players can bring another level of change. I, um, another discussion is the impact of today's player, today's current major leaguers. Um, in my opinion, the majority, it, it's not happening. And so you have generations of players that aren't focused or committed to going to HBCUs that aren't committed, you know, your Kyler Murray's where football is, you know, means so much more. Um, but to develop that more rounded understanding and love of the game, the community level. But I think the same deal when you talk about coaches being hired um, and getting opportunities, um, you know, there was a couple opportunity jobs that I had an opportunity to, to apply for an interview for, and the ADs decided to go in other directions. Um, when you compared resumes, not to be egotistical, but the resumes didn't match up. Um, I coached in the Big 12. I coached in the SEC. Um, I had ranked recruiting classes. Um, I was the coach of the year uh, in the state of Louisiana after we had the largest one-year turnaround in Division I history. But yet the response was, well, this guy was just a better fit. Well, that's a convenient excuse when you don't want to make that hire. But if you took the names off the resumes and you put resumes in front of them, you told an AD, you have to pick a resume. Don't worry about anything else. I want you to pick a resume based on experience. Going back to what Hired talked about, you're asking me to do X. I've done X. Now make a decision. Well, if they made the decision nine times out of 10, they're going to go with the resume that has more accolades on it. Well, oh, shoot, that happens to be 
the resume of a minority, a black coach. Oh, well, you know, this, well, so I don't know. It's, it's not feasible for us to be able to do that, but that's one of the things that um, as, as the chair of the diversity committee with the ABCA that we've talked about is talking to ADs, what is it that you're looking for when you're looking to hire a head coach? What does that coach need to do? Well, that coach needs to engage with the fan base. That coach needs to be able to associate with the donors and generate money and do all those types of things. Okay, we're going to find people that check those boxes. Now tell us why you're not going to hire it. Thanks again for joining us. And I'll pass it back to you, Brendan. Well said, everybody. Appreciate all of our panelists' time today. Appreciate all of our attendees for joining for the great questions. We really appreciate all of you. Just a reminder, as Scott said, Rediscovering America's Pastime is our digital issue this month at globalsportmatters.com. And you can follow us at Global Sport MTRS across social media to keep up with MLB content throughout the month, as well as everything we do here at the Global Sport Institute. Thanks, everybody.